before Resident Evil, before Alone in the Dark, there was Sweet Home, the foundation that survival horror built upon. The initial plan for Resident Evil was to be a remake of Sweet Home, instead it became a spiritual successor. Released in 1989 for the NES, it holds up well from an era which can veer into hit and miss territory. It's one of the better titles from the NES era. There are many elements and design decisions that were ahead of their time, yet it's remained somewhat obscure due to a limited release. Considering what came after in its wake, it's one of the more important titles in the gaming landscape. It's one of those titles I've been meaning to get around to. So come on in and let's see what Sweet Home has in store. Sweet Home never saw a release outside of Japan. There was never any official reason for it. It's thought that the dark subject matter was the culprit. Fan translations have popped up. If you're interested in playing, check the description for an updated version to use on top of it. The font is more readable in this version. What is notable about Sweet Home is it's based off a film of the same name from the same year of 1989. Like the game, there was never an official release outside of Japan. You can find it on YouTube with English subtitles. It's a decent film, nothing outstanding. Unlike most licensed titles during this era, there was much collaboration between the game and film. The film's executive producer and director both supervised the game's development. They gave the development team plenty of leeway. They can make any changes they want to the story to fit the game. A film crew of five receives access to the haunted Mamiya Manor in search of the lost frescoes of Ichiro Mamiya. However, the ghost of a woman traps the crew inside the mansion. Each of the five characters are playable, each carrying a special item only they can use. Kazuo has a lighter, used to burn down rope blocking her path. Akiko carries a remedy, used for removing status ailments. Takuchi carries a camera to take pictures of the frescoes. These contain hidden messages to help us progress. Asuka carries a vacuum. No, it's not used to catch ghosts like Luigi. Some frescoes need dust removed. Vacuum can pick up glass blocking her path. Did they expect this to slow us down? Pathetic. Emmy carries a key that opens most doors in the mansion. She is our master of unlocking. We could form a party of up to three characters. Why not a group of five? I'm not sure. The party forms a line instead of stacking on one another. You have to be careful with this. It's easy for one of your characters to get carried away by one of these spirits to another room. Switching back and forth between parties is a quick and simple process. Most of the game I'd have one party of three and the other two as a party. At some key points, I'd split them off further. I found Asuka and Takuji as the party of two work best, reason being for the use of the vacuum and camera. Some frescoes require both items to view their hidden message. Each character has a slot for their special item. They each have two slots for items and one slot for weapons. This gives us 10 item slots in total. There are no item boxes and we can't drop an item anywhere we want. However, we could swap them out for any item in the environment. It's like Resident Evil Zero, with most of the frustration removed. An incredible sense of foresight, Sweet Home places certain items nearby when you need them, and more than once. For example, at one point I need to reuse the mallet to clear out debris. However, I swapped it out for something else earlier in the mansion. Instead of backtracking, there was a mount nearby the debris. Item boxes would take care of this issue in Resident Evil. Remember, we're talking uncharted territory at the time. I didn't have much for past experience or references from other games to work with. It's why the NES era could be a bit hit and miss with how all games age. Sweet Home is one of the better aged titles from this era. While item management is present, Sweet Home is first and foremost a JRPG. There is no element of conserving ammo. Sweet Home doesn't make use of guns. Instead, we have random encounters. It's a stripped down system that keeps things moving at a quick pace. We have two damage stats. From what I understand, looking at guides, one is for damage on standard enemies and the other is for spirit based enemies. We could call the other party members that were not playing to join the fight. This is a great and quick way to keep your parties close together. When you call for your other party, they can move a large distance without interruption of other random encounters. Experience points aren't diluted across party members, so there's no reason not to call your other members over. It takes next to no time to do so. And it's not like the game is grind heavy. I never found myself sticking around an area to level up before progressing. It's not a long game either, this isn't some JRPG length, you could beat this game in a handful of hours. Some foes have a weakness to our key items. For example, bugs are weak to the lighter and bats are weak to the camera. What if a party member dies? That's it for them, they're dead and gone. No phoenix downs here. Leveling up does not replenish your HP. You could only heal HP with tonics, which are sparse. You do have to do a bit of a workaround to heal everyone. In combat, you call your other party members over to join the fight, and then you use a tonic as it heals everyone present. What about those key items if those characters die? Well, you'll find replacement items for them throughout the mansion. Again, there is not just one placement of them. You'll find them at key points. Combat encounters are easy, but they are not the only way we face danger. At various points, we'll have encounters that serve as proto-QTEs, something like a chandelier will fall, and we have to pick a direction to dodge. Although these aren't life or death situations. Failure results in next to no damage, even at lower levels.
Traps and obstacles are present throughout the mansion that we have to be aware of. One being chasms, which we use boards to walk across. Walk across it too many times and it will collapse. We'll have to rescue our party member before they plunge to their death. These are the times to split groups smaller if you need to grab something further down. Some traps require an item to use to remove or nullify the damage, like using fire axe or fire traps or a pick to avoid sliding down ice. As long as you're careful with traps and using tonics every so often, it's easy to keep your entire party alive. When it comes to navigation, Sweet Home is an interconnected mansion. It uses looping level design that the classic Resident Evil titles would expand upon. There's not much for unlocking shortcuts to prior areas. Most areas are self-contained until the last fifth of the game, at which point you loop back to the starting area. Now you can access those doors with keys we picked up. Doors our master of unlocking couldn't unlock before. When we opened doors, the loading screens in Resident Evil took the door opening animation as a reference. Sweet Home came out in 1989 very much uncharted territory for the time. The idea of looping level design wasn't common. Metroid, one of the first major titles to do so, was only released three years prior to Sweet Home. There is no map, although I didn't find that to be an issue. You'll remember these locked doors that you need to return to later. One thing that Sweet Home is able to achieve is getting you into a rhythm, into a flow. Something that the classic RE titles are able to do, although it's a bit different here. In Resident Evil, the flow comes from deciding on how much ammo to take, how many item slots you want to have open, knowing what items will enable further progress. You're constantly juggling your inventory and your progression. You're thinking several steps ahead. In Sweet Home, it's more about character management. It's keeping your parties close together. It's having someone on hand to use their ability to deal with an obstacle. You keep in mind how many slots you have open and what you could swap out. While limited in working with 8-bit, Sweet Home does a fantastic job of getting the most atmosphere out of the NES. One key contributor being the fantastic soundtrack. It's some of the best 8-bit music I've heard. I love the Jaws-like music we get when we enter into combat. The elements of the story are unsettling as well. The ghost is Lady Mamiya, who fell into grief and took her own life when her young son fell into the house's incinerator. Going down to the basement where the incinerator is contains great tension. The way the narrative unfolds is another element where Sweet Home was ahead of the curve. You have to find notes and messages on frescoes to piece together what happened. There are cinematic moments to progress the plot that weren't something you'd saw often at this time. The number of ways that Sweet Home was ahead of the curve, not just in survival horror elements, is staggering. Of course, the game's not perfect. The last stretch before the ending has this frustrating bit with these spirits carrying you away. They come in great packs. You can hide here but the perspectives are confusing to follow. Otherwise, most things here were straightforward. For the most part, I knew what I needed to do next. There were only a couple of times where I had to open up a walkthrough briefly to get past some roadblocks. But considering how obtuse some games could be from this era, that was fine by me. Going through this video, it should be clear how much Sweet Home would lay down the foundations for survival horror, in particular the foundations of the Resident Evil series. Let's look more at the people behind the scenes. Takuro Fujiwara directed Sweet Home. He has quite the development resume, directing a number of notable Capcom titles during the 80s such as Ghosts and Goblins and Bionic Commando. In the 90s, he would shift toward being a producer. Fujiwara wanted to revisit the world of Sweet Home as technology advanced to better capture what he had in mind. He saw a future in horror titles. The Sony PlayStation gave him the tools necessary to execute on that vision. Well, for the most part. A first-person perspective is what they were shooting for, but technical constraints got in the way. That's where they looked to Alone in the Dark for inspiration and made use of fixed cameras. They didn't have the film rights to Sweet Home, so instead they made a spiritual successor with their own universe, that being Resident Evil. Fujiwara would produce the title and chose Shinji Mikami, someone he was a mentor to as the director. His reasoning being Shinji hated being scared and would understand what would make horror work. 
Many elements of Resident Evil were lifted right from Sweet Home with various tweaks, and the end result was the beginning of a long-running franchise and kickstarting the survival horror genre. Fujiwara was right on there being an audience for horror titles. Funny enough, this would be the last title Fujiwara would work on at Capcom. He resigned from the company right after the release of Resident Evil in 1996 as he felt stifled from a creative standpoint. He would go on to develop the Tomba series, a series I best associate with one of the more well-known moments in Lolcal history. So confirmed, Santa's number one helper is a squirrel. I would really prefer if you would be quiet. <laughs> but yes, you are correct. From a design standpoint, the influence that Sweet Home has on gaming is staggering. It laid down the foundation for survival horror, which would take the gaming world by storm in the mid to late 90s. While many elements would be improved upon, I was blown away by how playable it still is. It's a game I recommend you should play yourself. Not just for historical reasons, but the fact it's one of the better titles from the NES era. Thanks for watching.